clearly from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now I want to start the sermon there, beginning in uh, verse 9, where the Bible says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me. Now we love that first part of the verse, and that's something I think that's been on a lot of people's minds lately, those that are associated with our church or other churches like this. We understand that we're living in a time and we're seeing great things that are being done, and we could even say for ourselves that a great door has been opened unto us. A great door and effectual is open unto us and our church and to other churches like ours. We're seeing great things that are being done for God. Like, as for an example, yesterday, the, the soul winning marathon that took place. We saw thousands of people go out and go soul winning. We saw thousands of people get saved all across Amen. the world. And we would say that is a great door and effectual. It's effectual because it's effective. It's not just that there's a great door open and nothing's happening. It's effective because people are walking through that door. We've decided, we've seen what God has allowed us to be able to do in the times that we're living in. And some people have decided to walk through that door that's been opened unto them and become effectual. That's what it means to be effectual. It means to be, uh, to, uh, to be effective, to be uh, successful in what you're doing. And that's what we can see happening in our, in our own church and in this movement that we're a part of. We're seeing a lot of people that are beginning on board, getting on fire for God. I mean, probably the most exciting thing about it is that we see so many young people, so many people in their 20s and their 30s that are just on fire for God and wanting to do something other than just live for the world. They want to live for God. They want to go out and do great things for God. And we're very, you know, we would, we would look at the first part of that verse and we get very excited about it. And I think sometimes that there might be a danger that we might get so excited about the first half that we start to neglect the, first, the second half of that verse where it says, and there are many adversaries. And we might say, yeah, we understand that there's going to be some opposition. We understand that, you know, there's going to be some difficulties and trials along the way. But Paul's saying here that he's going to tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. He's going to stay in Ephesus because there was a great and effectual door op open to him. And there was a lot of fruit that he had there in, uh, with the Ephesians. But he also says that there are many adversaries. He didn't say there are a few adversaries. He didn't say there's some trouble that we have to deal with. He said there are many adversaries. And I think Paul's trying to get across to people and help us to understand here that if we're going to be effectual, if we're going to walk through that door that God has opened unto us in, in, the, in the times that we're living in, that we're going to have to understand that there are going to be many adversaries. Not just a few, not things that just happen every once in a while, but if there's probably going to be a consistent attack against the, the yeah. movement of God. And I think this, you know, this year, last year alone uh, has just been a perfect example of that. It just seems like one thing after another keeps rearing up its head. One thing keeps you know, resurfacing, having to deal with this heretic or deal with that heretic or deal with some group of people that are opposing the man of God here or opposing the man of God there. Getting a pastor banned from this country or banned from that country. People sneaking into the church and trying to teach damnable heresies. You know, and that's just our own example. I'm sure if we were to go to other churches that are trying to walk through that effectual door as we are and we start to talk to them and the people in the pews there, they could start to relate to, to us and show us how there are many adversaries in the world today. How they could, from their own personal experience, they could say, look, we're, we're experiencing opposition here. We're experiencing the adversary coming against us. So we have to understand that, yeah, we're going to go through that door. We're going to walk through this door. We're going to be effectual. But let's be vigilant. Let's be sober. Let's walk circumspectly and understand that there is going to be many adversaries. And, of course, we think, you know, when we say that, uh, when we think of the many adversaries, there's, there's a lot of things that might come to mind, just generally speaking, and, you know, the heretics or, or just, you know, the, the sodomites, just these kind of general things. But there's also, I think, some things that we have to deal with on a daily basis in our own lives, even as, as individuals, that would be, we could classify as an adversary, and that would make it, you know, many adversaries. And if you would, uh, turn over to 1 John chapter 2, Put it, but keep a bookmark there in 1 Corinthians 16. I turn over to 1 John chapter 2. You see, we have to understand that there's many adversaries. And I want to just talk about a few of those adversaries real quick. One of those adversaries, one of those people that are, those things that are going to oppose us is the world. But one of the first adversaries we have to understand is the opposition of the world. The world is going to come against us every single day. The world wants to draw us away. The world wants to pull us away from the things of God. It wants us to pull us out of the, uh, out of the, out of the will of God. The world is constantly trying to get us away from serving God. Bible says there in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Verse 15, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we see that even within the world there are many adversaries. There's the flesh, 
There's the eyes. There's the pride of life. There's all these things that come from the world and that are, are not of the Father. These are adversaries that we have to face every day. We are going to have to face our own flesh. We're going to have to face our own lust. We're going to have to face our own pride. That's one of the many adversaries. And if each individual is having to deal with these same sins or these same adversaries, that's how you can say there are many adversaries. Because we're all facing some of these similar adversaries. John, turn over to 1 John chapter 3. There's the opposition of the world. Even within our own, you know, the, 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 the allure that the world has to our own flesh. That's an opposition to the effectual work of God. But another one of those adversaries of the world would be the fact, you know, just the world and generally speaking of the people that are in it and that hate the things of God, that hate the work of God, that hate the man of God, that hate the word of God. You're there in 1 John chapter 3, but I'll read for you from, 1 John, or from John 15 where Jesus said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So, of course, this is in the Gospel of John, and John's hearing these words with his own ears, and he's hearing Jesus say that the world is going to hate you. That if we're going to do a work for God, if we're going to live for God, if we're going to preach the Word of God, if we're going to go out and do the work of God, we have to understand that the world's going to hate that. They're going to come against it. That's one of the many adversaries that we're going to have to face is the world. And that's why John repeats it there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, where he said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. It should never come as a shock to us when we see the protesters, when we see uh, you know, a man of God on the nightly news being ridiculed by the world, when, when we see all the, the, the wicked and evil comments that people leave on social media just to go out, out of their way to, to just try and be hurtful with their words and with their actions to uh, opposing the man of God. Of course, that's a light affliction. Those are, those are easy things. But the, I'm telling you, the people that can't even, that are marvel at something as simple as that, as a protest, as some people with some signs standing on your front lawn. You know, and I'm sure it's easy to say that when you're, when you're not the one going through it, but when a man of God has to go through that, I'm sure it seems a little bit more intense, but I'm telling you something, a real man of God wouldn't marvel at that. He would say, this is what Jesus said would happen. But we have to understand that it's going to get far worse than that if we're going to live for God. As we grow, uh, draw closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, when we come closer and closer to the day when that, the man of sin is revealed, the world is going to hate us more and more and more. That's right. I can't remember who I, I was just speaking with someone. Uh, I think it was Pastor Anderson who was saying how even it seems lately in these last few uh, months, like the city of Tempe or the people that live in these apartment com complexes are just ramping up their hatred for soul winning. It seems like he said, you know, and, and his, what, and his sermon was last week, you know, that they would get run out or have the cops called like once, once a year, twice a year. But now it's just every single week it seems like. And I'm telling you, we're going to see, we're going to see more and more of that. As we walk through this effectual door that God has opened to us, there's going to be many adversaries. And we're going to see people just come out of the woodwork or trying to oppose the work of God. It's important that we understand that because we are not to marvel at such a thing. It should not surprise us. So that's one of the first adversaries of the many adversaries that we have to look at is the opposition of the world. And then, of course, there would be the opposition of our own flesh, which we kind of touched on there from 1 John 2. I'll read from you from uh, 1, 1 Peter. Go ahead and turn over to Galatians 5. 1 Peter 4. The Bible says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with, likewise with the same mind, for he hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin. You know, we're going to suffer in the flesh. If we're going to live for God, if we're going to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, our own flesh is going to come as, against us. That's going to be one of the many adversaries that we're going to have to face if we're going to live for God. It's our own flesh trying to, trying to do its own thing. We're going to have to bring our body under and bring it into subjection. We have to be as Christ was and suffer in the flesh. We have to arm ourselves with that mind if we're going to withstand that adversary. You're over there in Galatians chapter 5. I'll read from Romans chapter 13 where the Bible says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So we have to, you know, Paul here in Romans is, is likening this unto a battle. He's saying, look, we need to put on the armor of light. We need to be able to do battle with these adversaries, spiritually speaking, of course. And he's saying here you need to not make provision for the flesh. I mean, you think right. of a soldier who's going out to warfare. If he's going to let the flesh get in the way, he's not going to be effective. He's going to get taken out of the battle. He's going to be, you know, if he's the one who's he's going to start lagging behind and, and, and allow the flesh, his flesh pull him away from the rest of the troops, he's going to get picked off. 
You know, or if he's the one that it just decides to sit down and eat all of his rations immediately at the first meal, right? Because he's so hungry. He doesn't have enough discipline and character to spread it out over the length of the battle. These are just, you know, some real world applications that we can apply spiritually. We're the ones that are going to have to make it the long haul. We need to make sure that we're, we're getting the proper rations out of the Word of God, that we're putting on the armor, and that we're keeping pace with, with the, uh, the other uh, soldiers in Christ that are about us. And you're there in chapter Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 5, in verse 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Jump down to verse 24. And they that are in Christ, they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So again, we have the opposition of the flesh that we have to deal with if we're going to make it in the long haul for Christ. If we're going to walk through that effectual door and face these adversaries, we're going to have to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we've seen the, 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 uh, the adversary of the world. We've seen the adversary of the, of the flesh. What's another adversary? That would be the adversary of the devil. Go over and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now this is one that I think people, you know, a lot of, a lot of Christians would say, yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I can see where the flesh gets involved and I can see how the world hates us. But they, I think the devil, they kind of, they don't, people generally speaking don't understand how powerful the devil is and how he really is working. They just want to attribute kind of like the bigger things that the devil does. You know, he's just kind of off in the distance. You know, that's how subtle the devil is. He doesn't want, you know, he's, if we knew the truth about it, we'd probably understand that he was, he, he's probably more involved in, in opposing the work of God than anything else. That he is, he's the mastermind behind many things that go on to oppose the work of God. And then he has many minions, many uh, little, uh, you know, servants that he wants to use to send in and to disrupt the work of God. Look there at 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8, where the Bible reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And I think people want to uh, fall into this danger. Every time I read this verse, I think about uh, somebody I know who got up in a Sunday school and said, You know, the devil's a defeated foe. It says he's as a roaring lion there. But let me tell you something. The devil, he's a, he's a toothless old lion. All he can do is gum you. And I remember thinking that's not, that's not a very intelligent way to look at this verse. Because let me tell you something. The, the devil has a mouthful of things. And he can shred people up. And he can tear people up. And that's why we're to be sober. We're to be vigilant. If the, if the devil was just you know, some harmless roaring lion that we didn't you know, just some old fuddy duddy that we have to worry about, then why would there be a need to be sober? Why would there be a need to be vigilant? And that kind of say something to the, to the effect that you know, the devil is a defeated foe. That's true. But he's not defeated yet. And he's still very much uh, uh, alive and active in the world. And I think that uh, we, you know, a lot of Christians underestimate his ability and what he's able to do in this world, even against them personally. So it says, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So he has the ability to devour. And he's looking for those whom he may devour. And it's the people that are, are, are weak, the people that don't see him coming that he's going to get. If you ever watch a lion on these nature shows, you know, they don't just stand out in the middle of the field and just walk up to the gazelle or just walk up to the, the zebra, whatever prey they're hunting, and just tap them on the shoulder and, mind, and say, hey, do you mind if I just you know, go for the jugular here? You know, what they do is they crouch, they crawl, they, they, they ambush. That's how they attack. They, they, you don't even know they're there. And if you think about the, the prey that they're hunting, you know, they, those animals have developed, you know, the, the eyes and the side of the head so that they can look all around. They're sober, they're vigilant, they're able to keep an eye out. Even while they're, while they're grazing and, and going about uh, their life, they're always on the lookout for that adversary, that devil, that lion that's trying to devour them. And that's what we need Christians to do today. We need Christians today to wake up and understand that they have many adversaries. They have their own flesh to deal with. They have the world to deal with. But most of all, they have a, the devil, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren who is after them. Look at verse 9 where it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we have to resist the devil. And how do we do it? We do it in the faith. We need to be in the word of God. We need to be uh, with the people of God. Amen. We need to be with that, that herd and, 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 and to, uh, to use that protection effectively. Ephesians chapter 6, I'll read for you. The Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of, the wor of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
My friend, we have many adversaries, and many of those adversaries are very powerful people in this world. They have a lot of ability to do a lot of harm. I mean, they could do a lot of things to try to go against the work of God. You know, and just think of a, of a recent example. You know, it's not, of course, the worst thing that could ever happen to us. But we've been able, in the times that we're living in, we've been able to, to, to see uh, uh, you know, Pastor Anderson, a man of God, leverage technology in such a way as to spread the, 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 the gospel message, as to reach out in the world and do a great work for God. And how has he done that? Through the means of the Internet, through the means of YouTube and Facebook and social media. He's been able to use that. And I think it's a very wise thing to do. And it boggles the mind of how many pastors are, don't, don't get that. I mean, they're just so proud of the fact that they don't even know how to turn a computer on. You know, they're just like, they, they, just, they, they, they glory in the fact that they're illiterate when it comes to a, how to use social media. But now we see a, a, a somebody, a man of God, who who's understands the times that we're living in. And as, you know, as he's even said, it's likened social media under the, 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 the printing press of our day. It's revolutionary. It's changed the way we've done things. I mean, how else have we been able to go out and reach into all these different uh, countries internationally and all these other states and get all those numbers? I mean, think about what happened yesterday. Thousands of people went out all across this world that were organized months in advance. And it wasn't done by handwritten letter. It was done over email. It was done over social media. And then at the same day that people go out and do these things, within a 24-hour period, we can count and report every single person that was saved, every single person that went out and was soul winning. That's the times we're living in. And we would say, you know, what a great tool. What an effectual door we could use. Well, there are many adversaries, aren't there? And now we've got, what, what's YouTube doing? You know, they're, they're putting strikes on the channels. They're kicking anybody conservative off their platform, trying to limit the message of God, trying to only have one viewpoint be expressed on their medium. So that is a simple example, but it just goes to show us that we're wrestling against principalities in high places, that the people that we're doing battle with, they are very high in authority. They have a lot of power. Those are many, one of the many adversaries that we have to deal with. But what's another one that we've dealt with recently, even within our own church, it would be false brethren. That would be another adversary that we have to deal with. Yeah. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. Now, so even in Paul's day, he's telling him, look, there was false brethren that crept in unawares. Even in Paul's day, in the very beginning of the, of, of the church, we see these people creeping in and trying to, and, and trying to uh, spy out our liberty and bring people into bondage. That's, so nothing new, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing has changed. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 2. What did Paul do? He said in verse 5, To whom he gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the, tr the truth of the gospel might continue with you. When false brethren are found out, when false brethren are, are, are exposed for what they are, they're not to be dealt with for an hour. They're not to be, to be tolerated at all. They're to be cast out and they're to be done with. That's what Paul did here. He said that they didn't give place to them for one hour yeah. once it came out what they were. And that's the attitude we have to have because we have many adversaries in the world. We have our own flesh. We have the world. We have principalities in high places. We have the devil. Why should we give place to, to some false bro brother that's trying to come in and, and, and teach damnable heresies? Why would we give place to that? We've got enough on our plate. We've got enough adversaries to deal with. We shouldn't have to deal with those people even for an hour. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. What did Paul say to the pastors that he, that he had called together? He said, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. He didn't say, I suspect, I suspect this. Or this is my, I got a hunch. He said, no, I know this. This is what's going to happen. He said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. He didn't say they might. He said it could happen. He didn't say potentially. He said, no, they shall come in. Shall, they, they shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Have we not seen that? Have we not seen men creep in and speak perverse things contrary to the plain teaching of Scripture and draw away disciples after them? We have seen that physically, firsthand, in our own church. Yeah. That shouldn't come as a shock to us. I mean, Paul's warning us, and these are the many adversaries that we have to deal with. He said in 2 Peter chapter 2, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there also shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon them swift destruction. You say, what's the point of the sermon this morning? Is it just to remind us of all the difficulty and all the trials that we're going to have? Well, yes, in part it is. I want us to wake up and understand that we're going to have many adversaries. 
that we have a great and effectual door that we're walking through and we're saying great things done for Christ. And I believe it's just the beginning of the great things that we can see done for God. I think we're going to see more and more churches start. We're going to see more and more people get fired for God. We're going to see more people want to go out and go soul winning on a regular basis, not just on one big day, but they're going to get inspired by what they saw yesterday and say, I want to go out more and more. I know I took a guy out yesterday. He'd, he'd probably never been out before, or very little. He was my silent partner. And I remember we went door knocking and door knocking. Person after person didn't want to listen or whatever it was. But we got to that one door. That woman just listened. I'm telling you, she was just ready to receive everything I said. Amen. No, no opposition. Just, yes, I believe that. Yes, I believe that. Understood, paid attention. And I remember walking away from the door and my silent partner just amazed. That was so easy, he said. I can't believe she was just ready. She listened to everything. She agreed with all of it. I said, that's, that's soul winning. That's how easy it is. That's inspiring. I remember when we went to the Portland Soul Winning Marathon, I had a, a guy with me. And we, it was kind of the same scenario. We went all day and we didn't really see a lot of people say it. But at the end of the day, I'm standing there in the living room with a, a whole family, a mom, a dad, and a couple teenagers. And the whole family got saved. And we walked out on cloud Amen. nine. And that young man today is a faithful and dedicated soul winner in a local church. So we're gonna, we want people to wake up and, and understand that there's, a lot of, uh, there's an effectual door to walk through. And we're going to see more and more of it. But as we walk through that door, we have to understand that there are many adversaries. And they're going to increase more and more as we progress here. So what's the point? Not just to wake us up to that, but to encourage us and to help us to understand that we need to stand. If you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, look at verse... Let's see if I here... Look at verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like man. And that's the title of the sermon this morning. Stand. That's what we need to do. If we're going to make it, if we're going to make it to the end, if we're going to live our lives for Christ, if we're going to see a, continue to see a great and effectual work done for God, we have to understand that we're, there's some things we have to do in order to stand. We're going to have to stand. We're going to have to stand tall, stand our ground, not budge, not give an inch. Because even though we have many adversaries coming against us, we need to be able to stand. They're trying to knock us down. They want us to back up. They want us to go back where we were, to go back through that door, close the door, forget about through that effectual door. Don't look at it. Go do something else. Go back to the world. Go live for the flesh. Let the devil have his way with you. But I'm telling you, if we're going to make it, we have to be willing to stand. And how are we going to stand? The first thing we're going to do is it says there in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. He didn't just say stand fast. He said stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men and be strong. So if we're going to stand, we're going to have to stand in the faith. We're going to have to stand in the faith, meaning with God's people, in God's house, listening to the preaching of God's word. Yeah. You're not going to stand on your own. You're not right. going to stand. As much as you love God and love the Bible and want to see great things done for God, if you're out there just floating around, just wandering about, not in a local church, just doing your own thing, you're not going to stand. That's right. You need to stand in the faith. You need to get with God's people in God's house under the preaching of God's word from God's man and be with the people of God. And if you're going to stand, you need to stand in the faith. Look there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand. You're going to stand, you know, you need to be saved. You need to, you need to stand in the, in the gospel that was preached unto you. Of course, that's the first thing, right? People need to be saved and understand that they need to stand in that gospel, not be moved from the fact that they've been saved, that they've been uh, bought, uh, born again through the blood of Christ. Colossians chapter, uh, go ahead and turn over to John chapter 15. I'll read for you. Go to John 15. I'll read Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says in Colossians 1, Now he which established us with, with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Who has sealed us and given us the earnest of, our, of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a witness, or for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over you, your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. But Paul's saying here, look, we're not coming, you know, a lot of people, they don't want to stand in faith because they don't like the Pauls. They don't like the men of God. They don't like the people that are going to straighten them out from the Word of God. They don't like to be preached at. They don't like somebody to get out and maybe get the word, open up the word of God and maybe deal with some of the sin in their life or show them where they need to work on this area in their life. You know, and, and they think, well, you know, you're just picking on me. He's saying, look, they're, they're, not, they're not there to have dominion over your faith, but they're there to be helpers of your joy. 
You need to stay in the faith because the man of God wants to help you. That's what's going to help you. That's what's going to establish you. And understand that you, by faith you stand. When you have faith, when you can see that you need to be there, when you can see that you know maybe maybe I don't like the, the way the the way the preaching's going, but if I stand by faith, I know things will get better. I'll be made better for it. You know, uh, I remember my pastor back in Michigan used to say, you know, if he's rubbing the fur the wrong way, on a, you ever pet a cat and you, you pet him from the tail to the head? They hate that. You ever do that? If you have a cat, try it one day. You start the tail and you rub him in the back all the way to the head. They just hate it. I had a cat and he couldn't stand it. So my pastor would say, you know, if I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, cat can turn around. That's what needs to happen. That's what a lot of people in churches need to do. People get in a church and they, they, at first they like it and then they, they feel like, man, the, the pastor's kind of rubbing me the wrong way. He's taking the word of God out and, he, and, he's, and he's stroking the fur the wrong way. Well, don't expect the man of God to change. You need to just understand by faith. You need to stand in, that, in the faith with God's people and understand that maybe you need to change. Maybe you need to turn around and then, then that, that fur will get, get pet the right way. So we need to stand in the faith. And not only that, but we, we need to stand in the faith by faith. That's the point I'm trying to make here. It's not enough to say I'm going to be with God's people. You know, I'm going to get in, and a lot of people, they, they, they mean well. They've got good intentions. They get in the house of God. They get with God's people. They start out. But then they forget that it's not just going to, every, it's not like the pastor's going to get up and pull out a magic wand and just make your life a, just a bed of roses. That's not how it works. You're going to have to put some forth some effort if you're going to stand in the faith. Yeah. You're the one who's going to have to understand that, you know, maybe things aren't the way they are today, but down the road, they'll get better. If you're going to stand in the faith, you have to stand by faith. You have to stand by faith in order to stand in the faith. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look at John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. You know, we need Jesus Christ. We need to abide in Christ if we're going to accomplish something. You understand, you know, I don't, maybe you don't fully understand what God's got for you, or why God lays things out in the Bible the way he does why God has the standards that he does, why God has the commandments and the rules that he does. But you have to understand by faith that God has put those things there for a reason. And you need to abide in those things if you're going to be fruitful. We might not like it at first. We might not understand it at first. But if we abide in it by faith, if we stand in the faith by faith, then we can be fruitful. Then we can stand. Then we can walk through that door. Then we can resist the many adversaries that are going to come at us. So we see, first of all, that we need to stand in the faith. If we're going to stand, if we're going to resist the devil, if we're going to resist the flesh, if we're going to resist the world, and we're going to make it, if we're going to be effectual and walk through that door, we have to understand that we're going to have to stand in the faith. And not only that, but the other stand, one of the other stands we're going to have to take is to stand against sin. We're going to have to take a stand against sin. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. You know, we want that victorious Christian life. We want to be able to say, you know, there, there's these sins in my life. I remember I was talking to a brother just yesterday who was telling me, man, since I started listening to Pastor Anderson, I don't do this anymore. I quit doing this. I haven't done this in so long. He listed off just like all these things. I mean, not terrible, horrible, wicked things, but things that a Christian ought not be doing. He's able to say, I, haven't, I didn't do those. And once I found the preaching of the Word of God, once I heard a man of God get up and rip face and tell it like it is from the Bible and say, thus saith Lord, he said, I got right. I got the thing straightened out. You know, that was a guy who stood in the faith by faith and saw it play out in his life and is becoming fruitful. Amen. He took a stand against sin. And he said, you know what? He was given some liberty that Christ gave him. You know, Christ has given him, made, give, uh, hath made him free and has given him liberty. But I'm telling you, if we're not careful, if we don't take a stand against sin in our life, we will be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, as it says there. People who aren't willing to stand with, with, with Christ uh, and the liberty wherewith they have been made free, if they don't take a stand against the sin, when the flesh rises up and wants them to sin again, when that old temptation pokes its head back up, when the old friends come around, when you get around that certain crowd, when you're back in that certain place, when nobody else is looking, when you think you can get away with it, and you say, you know what, it's been so long, let me try it again, let me see if I can just get away with this one more time, and miss, you miss your old sin, you start to long for the things of the world again, and what you do is you're not standing. You're starting to sit down. You're starting to get comfortable with that sin again. You're not taking a stand against sin. And what's going to happen? You're going to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And we don't want to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Think about being entangled, being, being all bound up. And, and you know, it's, I envision that when I read this about somebody 
know, like basically falling into a net. You know, someone was just wrapped up in a net. You ever, and you ever seen anybody get wrapped up in a net? You know, it, that's really hard to get out of. I mean, it's, it's a mess. How hard it would be. Why would we want that for our lives spiritually? To get wrapped up in some net of sin and be entangled with the, with the, the yoke of bondage. So we need to be able to take on, take a stand against sin. You know, and those of us that would be preachers one day, those of us that would, you know, get up and preach the word of God from the pulpit, we need to be willing to take a stand against sin from the pulpit. There are things in the Bible that we need to preach on a regular basis and make sure people understand that God is not pleased with certain sins in their lives. I mean, there's no sin that he's pleased with, but there's certain sins, you know, that would even get you kicked out of church. Yeah. The drunkenness, the fornication. You know, uh, the covetousness, the, all these, there's all these things, these sins that are so prevalent in our society today. So many sins today that are just tolerated in so many other churches. And the temptation for the man of God when he gets up there is to say, you know what? I, I like the crowd that I'm seeing. I got a good group showing up. You know, the, the, the tithe, the offerings coming in. You know, maybe, maybe I could just make, take it easy, maybe pull back on the word of God a little bit. Maybe not take such a hard stand on some of these issues. Maybe I could bring in the contemporary music. Maybe I could change the version of the Bible. Maybe I could do all these different things to try and tweak my church service or try and tweak the way we do things here at this church. But we have to understand that we need to take a stand against sin. We need to take a stand and preach, thus saith the Lord, and let uh, the chips fall where they may and let people just like it or lump it. That's a, that's a stand against sin that people are going to have to take. A man of God is going to take a stand against sin in, 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 from the pulpit. Not only that, we're going to have to take, as individuals, we're going to have to take a stand against sin in our personal lives. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 5. You turn to Galatians 5, it says, it says in Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ live with me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's a real famous verse, you'll hear people quote that. And you know, it's those lat that latter half that we really like, right? Nevertheless, I live, not I. Christ liveth in me, you know, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. But how does it start out, that verse? It says, I am crucified with Christ. That's a stand against sin. That's, a, that's, a, that's something that Paul was able to say. He says, look, I'm a dead man walking. The flesh, the life that I'm living in this body, I'm living like a dead man. Somebody who's already, someone who's dead to sin. Somebody who's, whose life is not his own. Someone who's been bought with a price. Someone who's going to glorify God in his body and let God have his way with him. He's saying, it's not my will, but thine be done. That's what he means when he says, I am crucified with Christ. And that's the attitude that we have to have. That's why it says there in Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 24. And they that are Christ. Now, who is that? Well, that's you this morning. That's us. If we're sitting here in church, if we're saved, we've been born again, if we've been bought by the blood of Christ, we have to understand that we are Christ's. And they that are Christ have crucified the, the flesh with the affections and lusts. So we, have, we need to have that attitude. We understand that we are crucified with Christ. Why would we want to live life like a dead man? Why would we want to live life in, in, with, in the flesh with the affections of lust? That's a dead, that's a, that's a dead body that we're trying to resurrect. That's, that's, somebody, that's, that's an old way of living that we're trying to, to still walk in. The affections and lust that have been crucified in Christ. We got, you know, that's, that's not a good way to live. It stinks. We need to make sure that we're going to take a stand against sin in our own personal life. So we need to take a stand, you know, from the pulpit as men of God. We need to take a stand in our personal lives against sin. But we need to take a stand in the world around you. Look over at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. If we're going to stand, we have to understand that we're going to have to stand against the world around you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory... Save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. That needs to be your stand. That's where you need to stand. That's the ground you need to stand on and say, look, I'm crucified in the world. You know, the world has a plan for you. You know, they have this big, long, everyone's just got their lives laid out. So you do this, and then you, do, you, know, you graduate, then you go to college, and you get married, and you have the kids, and you work a successful job, you save up a bunch of money, you buy the house, you get retired. And that's, that's how people go about their lives. There's nothing in it, you know, inherently sinful about that necessarily. But when it becomes that's the only thing that's going on in your life, that's just a vain, empty life. That's just something that's not going to bear any fruit for Christ. At the end of your day, you know, you're just going to, what, what will you have accomplished? You know, I started a business. I saved a bunch of money. I took a lot of vacations. I acquired a lot of stuff. That's all vanity. If we're going to stand for Christ, if we're going to 
Stand against the adversary. If we're going to walk through an effectual door, we have to understand that we are crucified in the world and the world unto us. You know, it's fine to have the house. It's good to get married. It's good to have the, the job and do what we need to do in order to provide for our own in this world. We have to understand that's not the end all be all of life. What we're trying to accomplish here is something for God. We want to get to the end of our lives and say, hey, what, what, did, you, what did you do for, with your life? I lived for God. I served God all the days of my life. I raised godly children who are living for God today. I went out and I saved souls. I went out and I preached the gospel. I went out and I, you know, I started a church. I went out and I, and I, I saw people come to Christ. I saw people come and, and, and they get their lives changed. And now they're effectual soul winners. I did whatever it is, something for God. That's what we want to get to the end of our lives. That's not going to happen if we don't take a stand. But we're not willing to be crucified of the world and the world unto us. So it's, it's, you know, it's easy to get pumped up and say, yeah, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stand for, for Christ. I'm going to stand against the world. I'm going to stand against my own flesh. I'm going to stand against sin and the world around me. But I have to understand something. It takes effort and purpose to stand. It's not just going to happen. It's something you have to determine and purpose in your own heart that you're going to do. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Read, read, read a little bit of scripture here. In Ephesians chapter 6, when the Bible says, beginning in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. There's some things that you're going to have to do in order to stand. It's not just going to happen. You're going to have to do all in order to stand. You're going to have to stand, therefore, it goes on in verse 14, having your loins girt about with the truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. There's some things that you're going to have to put on in your life. You're going to have to gird up your own loins. You're going to have with the truth. You're going to have to get in the word of God and allow the truth to gird up the loins of your mind. You're going to have to you'll put on the breastplate of righteousness. You're going to have to do all these things. You have to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These aren't things that you do on the way to the battle. This armor, you don't put it on, on, on while you're on your way there. These are things that you have to sit down and put on. That's why, you know, in the army, they have barracks. They have, these, they have a headquarters. They have a base of operations where the soldiers can come back and get prepared. They can do the, the things that they need to do in order to go out and win the battle and go out and defeat the enemy. So, the point I'm trying to make is here that if we're going to stand, if we're going to take a stand against the devil, if we're going to take a stand against the world or the sin in our life or, or any of these things that we've talked about this morning, we're going to have to understand that it's going to take purpose and effort in order to do it. We're going to have to put these things on in our lives. We're going to have to get with the people of God, get in the Word of God, get under the preaching of the Word of God, and begin to learn about what God has for us to do and what it's going to take in order to stand. He says in verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Look, there's a shield of faith out there that we can take that can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All the darts that the devil's going to throw our way. As we walk through that door, that effectual door, as we walk through it and we, and we start to see great works were done, and we understand that the devil's going to start firing all of his fiery darts at us, it's going to happen. It's not a maybe. It will happen. It's real easy to get discouraged. It's really to get down and say, you know what, I just, there's just too much opposition I don't see how we can do it. The world's too far gone. You know, it just seems like everybody's against us. My own family's got problems with us. And, you know, the, the, the world hates us. You know, and, and sometimes you might even think you're a little crazy. But I'm telling you something. There's a, there's a shield there, the shield of faith. And if you'll take the time, if you'll take the purpose and the effort to go and pick up the shield and put it on, you can quench every single fiery dart that comes your way. Good. That's encouragement. That we can have a shield that God has provided the armor that we need. God hasn't just left us wandering around in the wilderness, not understanding what it is we need to do. God has given us everything we need to live the successful life. God has given us everything we need in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 17, he says, To take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have, we not, we have all, these, all these things here in the armor. We have you know, the sword and the helmet and the... And the and the shot, you know, get shot at our feet with the gospel of peace, and we can put on the breastplate of righteousness. All these defensive pieces of armor, right? All these things that are meant to protect us. We have to understand that that's not God doesn't want us to just, you know, hunker down in some bunker somewhere, and you know, with the stores and with the with the rations. 
and just wait this thing out. God has given us an offensive weapon where it says there, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God has given us a sword. And what's a sword for? A sword is to go out there and to slay. A sword is to go out there and to hack them up. A sword is to go out there and to fight. It's to go out there and to swing. It's in order to go out there and engage the enemy. That's what a sword is used for. So God wants us to go out with the sword, the Word of God, and engage the enemy. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that through what we saw yesterday. By continuing to do what we saw yesterday, by going out and preaching the gospel, not just on the big days, not just on the marathons, but the day in, the day out, right. the week in, the week out, year after year after year, fighting that battle all the way to the end, standing for God until we get to the end. And we're able to say that we've done, accomplished something for God, that we've stood, that we've fought the fight, that we've run the, our course, that we have, we've, uh, we've, we've kept the faith. That's what we need to do. We need to take that offensive weapon and go out and fight the armor. See, putting on the armor is work. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. You're going to have to know how to put it on. You're going to have to know how to pick up that sword and swing it. You're going to take time getting the Word of God, marking the, you know, the, the, the Romans road, knowing the verses that you're going to turn to, and how to swing that sword. You don't just pick up a sword and go out there and start blindly waving it around. I mean, it reminds me if you ever watch guys like they get into, you know, like the, on the YouTube, sometimes you'll see like, Guys that get in like these, these, these altercations, these fist fights. And you can tell a guy who's never thrown a punch. A guy who's never, I mean, it's, just, it's just obvious. And you watch an actual like trained fighter and how they stand, how they throw their punches. Like I, I wouldn't, I'd probably be hilarious to watch me. And <laughs> I've never learned how to do it correctly. But if you watch somebody who's trained and knows what they're doing, man, they're, they can be pretty effective with just one swing, right? But then you watch these other guys who are just throwing from the hip. You know, it's everything they got and every punch and they gas out. And it's kind of amusing to watch guys go at it like that. But the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, it's going to take effort. You're going to take some training. You're going to have to put in some time if you're going to be an effective soldier for Jesus Christ. If you want to go out there and not just throw haymakers at the devil, but you actually want to be effective, take the sword of God and swing it and, and, and you know, not just beat at the air, as Paul said, but, you know, to fight effectively, you're going to have to take the time to put on the armor. You have the time to pick up the sword and understand how to swing it. And people, you know, that's where they really get discouraged. They say, well, that just sounds like too much. You know, that just sounds like a lot of work to just go out there and get in a fight. I mean, who, who wants to sign up for that? Who wants to sign up to just go out and get, get in a fight? Who wants to just go out and go and engage the enemy in this battle? And put all this effort into it. You know, take all this, you know, the, all this uh, ridicule on the chin and, and to have the world come against you and have all these, you know, uh, the, the devil and all these many adversaries. Who wants to walk through that door? It's so much work. But we have to understand that there is a purpose behind the preparation. There's a reason why we take the time to put the armor on. There's a reason why we take the time to learn how to stand. There's a reason to stand today. We need to stand before those who have stood before us. Because there are those that have come before us through, since the beginning of time that have taken the same stand. And they've held their ground. And they've res they preserved it for us. I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of giants in a way when we, by holding up this book. I mean, the things that people went through for us to have a, the, the Word of God in our own language. I mean, ultimately, God's the one that provided it. We know that. But God used men as instruments in order to do that. And men stood their ground. There were men that were burned and alive at the stake for us to have the Bible today. There was men that took a great stand. We need to stand today. Why put the effort to walk through that door? Why put the effort to stand today? Because of those that have stood before us. I'll read for you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, where until you are called by our gospel to the obtaining of our, uh, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold to traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. He's saying, look, stand fast and hold the traditions that ye have been taught. And that's what we need to do. I mean, as Baptists, we have a heritage behind us. You know, I, I've mentioned it before, but I, whenever I go out soul winning and you run into these Catholics, I want to get a little proud about the fact that they think that, you know, well, the bat, everybody else came out from us. You know, the Catholics were the original true church. And so they, they, we could trace our, 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 ourselves all the way back to the apostles. And it's just like this proud, puffed up attitude. But I just say, well, you know, we've, we as Baptists, we've got the trump card. You know, we've got the ace up our sleeves. We say, oh, yeah, who was that that baptized Jesus? It was John the, uh, who? The Baptist. That's right. So we can, <laughs> we can always play that one, right? But I'm saying we've got that lineage. 
We've got traditions as Baptists that have been handed down to us according to the Word of God. We've been taught things from the Word of God that are precious, that are dear, that people have stood on. Those are the things that we need to stand on today. We need to stand for those that have stood before us. Not only that, but we need to stand for those that are with us now. The Bible says in the Philippians, I'll read for you. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We need to stand together for the faith of the gospel. We need people that are going to come together and stand fast in one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We need to have one purpose. We need to have one motive in mind, the glory of God, to see souls saved. That's what we need to stand fast in. We need to stand, stand fast together and accomplish much. You know, many hands make light work. You know, if we're going to go out and face many adversaries, we need many people to stand with us. Right. We need a great army. We need people to stand fast in one spirit, in one accord, in one mind, and striving together. Not against each other, not individually, not here, some there, everyone kind of doing their own thing. People need to understand that we are all on, have the same battle plan, that we have the same sword, we have the same armor on, we have the same purpose, the same mission, and the same goal. To strive together for the faith of the gospel. We need to stand for those that are with us now. We need to stand for those who have stood before us. And lastly, we need to stand our ground today. We need to stand and go through the door against the adversary of, and against, you know, against the many adversaries for the sake of where we're going to stand one day. And I want to close on this thought if you turn over to Romans chapter 14. You know, maybe, maybe everything else, you know, the rest of what I've preached this morning isn't enough to convince people to stand. I think it has been, but in an autonomy. You know, we ought to stand for those that have stood before us. We ought to stand for those that are with us now. We ought to stand for our children. We ought to stand that we too can hand down the traditions we've been taught according to the word of God. But we need to stand one day because of one day where we're all going to stand. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Look, we need to stand today because one day we're going to stand before God. One day we're going to look God in the face and we're going to give account for everything that we've done in this life. We're going to account for how we stood here on earth. We're going to stand before God and he's going to, he's, we're going to have to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ for how we stood here. What was your stand like here? That's what's going to count when, when you stand there. We need to stand today because we're going to stand there one day. And that should be enough to motivate us. You know, that should put a little bit of fear in our hearts. That should cause us to want to get in the Word of God. That should cause us to want to get down on our knees and pray. That should want us to get in the Word of God and do God's will. And say, you know what? Maybe the preaching of the Word of God is a little rough here and there, but it's important. We need to take it. We need to take the rebukes. We need to take the rebuffs. We need to get things right. We need to get the sin of our lives. We need to stand against the adversaries today and walk through that effectual door because one day we're going to stand before God and give an account. So that's the message this morning, to stand. Stand now, because of one day where you will stand. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for uh, the Bible. Thank you for the preaching of it. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the fellowship that we have in you, Father. Thank you for, Lord, those that have gone before us and have stood their ground. Father, help us to stand. Help us to uh, be, be a generation that generations from now speak of. That, Lord, even a message like this might be preached, Lord, should you tarry years from now, uh, that, that a man would stand up and, and say, that they should stand for those that stood before them, that we would be those that stood now, that we would stand for those that are to come, and Lord, that we would stand for where we're going to stand one day. Father, help us to see the importance of it. Help us to walk through that effectual door. Help us to not be ignorant of the wiles of the devil. Help us to withstand him, Lord, in your power, in your might, and for your glory, we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. We'll go